Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Nine. Milbank was the son of one of the wealthiest manufacturers in Lancashire. His father, whose opinions were of a very democratic bent, sent his son to Eton, though he disapproved of the system of education pursued there, to show that he had as much right to do so as any duke in the land. He had, however, brought up his only boy with the due prejudice against every sentiment or institution of an aristocratic character, and had especially impressed upon him in his school career to avoid the slightest semblance of courting the affections or society of any member of the falsely held superior class. The character of the son, as much as the influence of the father, tended to the fulfilment of these injunctions. Oswald Milbank was of a proud and independent nature, reserved, a little stern. The early and constantly reiterated dogma of his father, that he belonged to a class debarred from its just position in the social system, had aggravated the grave and somewhat discontented humour of his blood. His talents were considerable, though invested with no dazzling quality. He had not that quick and brilliant apprehension, which, combined with a memory of rare retentiveness, had already advanced Coningsby far beyond his age, and made him already looked to as the future hero of the school. But Milbank possessed one of those strong, industrious volitions, whose perseverance amounts almost to genius, and nearly attains its results. Though Coningsby was by a year his junior, they were rivals. This circumstance had no tendency to remove the prejudice which Coningsby entertained against him, but its bias on the part of Milbank had a contrary effect. The influence of the individual is nowhere so sensible as at school. There the personal qualities strike without any intervening and counteracting causes. A gracious presence, noble sentiments, or a happy talent make their way there at once without preliminary inquiries as to what set they are in, or what family they are of, how much they have a year, or where they live. Now on no spirit had the influence of Coningsby, already the favourite, and soon probably to become the idol of the school, fallen more effectually than on that of Millbank, though it was an influence that no one could suspect except its votary or its victim. At school friendship is a passion, it entrances the being, it tears the soul. All loves of after-life can never bring its rapture or its wretchedness, no bliss so absorbing, no pangs of jealousy or despair so crushing and so keen. What tenderness and what devotion, what illimitable confidence, infinite revelations of inmost thoughts, what ecstatic present and romantic future, what bitter estrangements and what melting reconciliations, what scenes of wild recrimination, agitating explanations, passionate correspondence, what insane sensitiveness, and what frantic sensibility, what earthquakes of the heart and whirlwinds of the soul are confined in that simple phrase, a schoolboy's friendship. To some indefinite recollection of these mystic passages of their young emotion that makes grey-haired men mourn over the memory of their schoolboy days. It is a spell that can soften the acerbity of political warfare, and with its witchery can call forth a sigh even amid the callous bustle of fashionable saloons. The secret of Milbank's life was a passionate admiration and affection for Coningsby. Pride, his natural reserve, and his father's injunctions had, however, hitherto successfully combined to restrain the slightest demonstration of these sentiments. Indeed, Coningsby and himself were never companions except in school or in some public game. The demeanour of Coningsby gave no encouragement to intimacy to one who, under any circumstances, would have required considerable invitation to open himself. So Millbank fed in silence on a cherished idea. It was his happiness to be in the same form, to join in the same sport with Coningsby, occasionally to be thrown in unusual contact with him, to exchange slight and not unkind words. In their division they were rivals, Milbank sometimes triumphed, but to be vanquished by Coningsby was for him not without a degree of mild satisfaction. 
not a gesture, not a phrase from Coningsby that he did not watch and ponder over and treasure up. Coningsby was his model, alike in studies, in manners or in pastimes, the aptest scholar, the gayest wit, the most graceful associate, the most accomplished playmate, his standard of excellent. Yet Milbank was the very last boy in the school who would have had credit given him by his companions for profound and ardent feeling. He was not indeed unpopular. The favourite of the school like Coningsby he could, under no circumstances, ever become, nor was he qualified to obtain that general graciousness among the multitude which the sweet disposition of Henry Sidney or the gay profusion of Buckhurst acquired without any effort. Milbank was not blessed with the charm of manner. He seemed close and cold, but he was courageous, just, and inflexible, never bullied, and to his utmost would prevent tyranny. The little boys looked up to him as a stern protector, and his word, too, throughout the school was a proverb, and truth ranks a great quality among boys. In a word, Milbank was respected by those among whom he lived, and schoolboys scanned character more nicely than men suppose. A brother of Henry Sidney, quartered in Lancashire, had been wounded recently in a riot, and had received great kindness from the Milbank family, in whose immediate neighbourhood the disturbance had occurred. The kind duke had impressed on Henry Sidney to acknowledge with cordiality to the younger Milbank at Eton the sense which his family entertained of these benefits. But though Henry lost neither time nor opportunity in obeying an injunction which was grateful to his own heart, he failed in cherishing, or indeed creating, any intimacy with the object of his solicitude. A companionship with one who was Coningsby's relative and most familiar friend would at the first glance have appeared independently of all other considerations a most desirable result for Milbank to accomplish. But perhaps this very circumstance afforded additional reasons for the absence of all encouragement with which he received the overtures of Lord Henry. Milbank suspected that Coningsby was not affected in his favour, and his pride recoiled from gaining, by any indirect means, an intimacy which to have obtained in a plain and express manner would have deeply gratified him. However, the urgent invitation of Buckhurst and Henry Sidney, and the fear that a persistence in refusal might be misinterpreted into churlishness, had at length brought Milbank to their breakfast mess, though when he accepted their invitation he did not apprehend that Coningsby would have been present. It was about an hour before sunset, the day of this very breakfast, and a good number of boys in lounging groups were collected in the long walk. The sports and matches of the day were over. Criticism had succeeded to action in sculling and in cricket. They talked over the exploits of the morning, canvassed the merits of the competitors, marked the fellow whose play or whose stroke was improving, glanced at another whose promise had not been fulfilled, discussed the pretensions, and adjudged the palm. Thus public opinion is formed. Some, too, might be seen with their books and exercises intent on the inevitable and impending tasks. Among these, some unhappy white in the remove, wandering about with his hat, after parochial fashion, seeking relief in the shape of a verse. A hard lot this, to know that you must be delivered of fourteen verses at least in the twenty-four hours, and to be conscious that you are pregnant of none. The lesser boys, urchins of tender years, clustered like flies round the baskets of certain vendors of sugary delicacies that rested on the long walk wall. The pallid countenance, the lacklustre eye, the hoarse voice clogged with accumulated phlegm, indicated too surely the irreclaimable and hopeless votary of lollipop, the opium-eater of school days. "'It is settled. The match tomorrow shall be between aquatics and dry bobs,' said a senior boy, who was arranging a future match at cricket. "'But what is to be done about fielding major?' inquired another. He has not paid his boating money, and I say he has no right to play among the aquatics before he has paid his money. Oh, but we must have fielding major. He is such a devil of a swipe. I declare he shall not play among the aquatics if he does not pay his boating money. It is an infernal shame. 
Let us ask Buckhurst. Where is Buckhurst? Have you got any toffee? inquired a dull-looking little boy, in a hoarse voice of one of the vendors of scholastic confectionery. Tom Trot, sir. No, I want toffee. Very nice, Tom Trot, sir. No, I want toffee. I have been eating Tom Trot all day. Where is Buckhurst? We must settle about the aquatics. Well, I, for one, will not play if Fielding Major plays amongst the aquatics. That is settled. Oh, nonsense! He will pay his money if you ask him. I shall not ask him again. The captain duns us every day. It's an infernal shame. I say, Burnham, where can one get some toffee? This fellow never has any. I will tell you, at Barnes's on the bridge, the best toffee in the world. I will go at once. I must have some toffee. Just help me with this verse, Collins, said one boy to another, in an imploring tone. That's a good fellow. Well, give it us. First syllable in Fabri is short. Three false quantities in the two first lines. You're a pretty one. There, I have done it for you. That's a good fellow. Any fellow seen Buckhurst? Gone up the river with Coningsby and Henry Sidney. But he must be back by this time. I want him to make the list for the match tomorrow. Where the deuce can Buckhurst be? And now, as rumours rise in society, we know not how, so there was suddenly a flying report in this multitude, the origin of which no one in his alarm stopped to ascertain, that a boy was drowned. Every heart was agitated. What boy? When? Where? How? Who was absent? Who had been on the river today? Buckhurst. The report ran that Buckhurst was drowned. Great were the trouble and consternation. Buckhurst was ever much liked, and no one now remembered anything but his good qualities. Who heard it was Buckhurst, said Sedgwick, captain of the school, coming forward. I heard Bradford tell Palmer it was Buckhurst, said a little boy. Where's Bradford? Here. What do you know about Buckhurst? Wentworth told me that he was afraid Buckhurst was drowned. He heard it at the Brokers. A bargeman told him about it a quarter of an hour ago. "'Here's Wentworth! Here's Wentworth!' a hundred voices exclaimed, and they formed a circle round him. "'Well, what did you hear, Wentworth?' asked Sedgwick. "'I was at the Brocus, and a bargee told me that an Eton fellow had been drowned above Surly, and the only Eton boat above Surly today, as I can learn, is Buckhurst's four-oar. That's all.' There was a murmur of hope. "'Oh, come, come,' said Sedgwick. "'There is come chance.' Who is with Buckhurst? Who knows? I saw him walk down to the Brocus with Veer, said a boy. I hope it is not Veer, said a little boy, with a tearful eye. He never lets any fellow bully me. Here is Maltravers, hallooed out a boy. He knows something. Well, what do you know, Maltravers? I heard Boots at the Christopher say that an Eton fellow was drowned, and that he had seen a person who was there. "'Bring Boots here,' said Sedgwick. Instantly a band of boys rushed over the way, and in a moment the witness was produced. "'What have you heard, Sam, about this accident?' said Sedgwick. "'Well, sir, I heard a young gentleman was drowned above Monkey Island,' said Boots. "'A no-name mentioned?' "'Well, sir, I believe it was Mr. Coningsby.' A general groan of horror. "'Coningsby! Coningsby! By heavens, I hope not!' said Sedgwick. I very much fear so, said Boots, as how the bargeman who told me saw Mr. Coningsby in the lock-house laid out in flannels. I had sooner any fellow had been drowned than Coningsby, whispered one boy to another. I liked him, the best fellow at Eton, responded his companion, in a smothered tone. What a clever fellow he was, and so deuced generous. He would have got the medal if he had lived. And how came he to be drowned? For he was such a fine swimmer. I heard Mr. Coningsby was saving another's life, continued Boots in his evidence, which makes it in a manner more sorrowful. Poor Coningsby, exclaimed a boy, bursting into tears. I move the whole school goes into mourning. I wish we could get hold of this bargeman, said Sedgwick. Now stop, stop. Don't run all the way in that mad manner. You frighten the people. Charles Herbert and Palmer, you two go down to the Brocus and inquire. 
But just at this moment an increased stir and excitement were evident in the long walk. The circle round Sedgwick opened, and there appeared Henry Sidney and Buckhurst. There was a dead silence. It was impossible that suspense could be strained to a higher pitch. The air and countenance of Sidney and Buckhurst were rather excited than mournful or alarmed. They needed no inquiries, for before they had penetrated the circle they had become aware of its cause. Buckhurst, the most energetic of beings, was of course the first to speak. Henry Sidney indeed looked pale and nervous, but his companion, flushed and resolute, knew exactly how to hit a popular assembly, and at once came to the point. "'It is all a false report, an infernal lie. Coningsby is quite safe, and nobody is drowned.' There was a cheer that might have been heard at Windsor Castle. Then turning to Sedgwick in an undertone, Buckhurst added, "'It is all right, but by Jove we have had a shaver. I will tell you all in a moment, but we want to keep the thing quiet, and so let the fellows disperse, and we will talk afterwards.' In a few moments the long walk had resumed its usual character, but Sedgwick, Herbert, and one or two others turned into the playing fields, where, undisturbed and unnoticed by the multitude, they listened to the promised communication of Buckhurst and Henry Sidney. "'You know we went up the river together,' said Buckhurst. "'Myself, Henry Sidney, Coningsby, Vere, and Millbank. We had breakfasted together, and after twelve agreed to go up to Maidenhead. Well, we went up much higher than we had intended. About a quarter of a mile before we had got to the lock, we pulled up. Coningsby was then steering. Well, we fastened the boat too, and were all of us stretched out on the meadow, when Millbank and Vere said they should go and bathe in the lock pool. The rest of us were opposed, but after Millbank and Vere had gone about ten minutes, Coningsby, who was very fresh, said he had changed his mind and should go and bathe too. So he left us. He had scarcely got to the pool when he heard a cry. There was a fellow drowning. He threw off his clothes and was in in a moment. The fact is this, Millbank had plunged in the pool and found himself in some eddies caused by the meeting of two currents. He called out to Vere not to come and tried to swim off, but he was beat and seeing he was in danger, Vere jumped in. But the stream was so strong from the great fall of water from the lasher above that Vere was exhausted before he could reach Millbank and nearly sank himself. Well, he just saved himself but Millbank sank as Coningsby jumped in. What do you think of that? "'By Jove!' exclaimed Sedgwick, Herbert, and all. The favourite oath of schoolboys perpetuates the divinity of Olympus. And now comes the worst. Coningsby caught Millbank when he rose, but he found himself in the midst of the same strong current that had before nearly swamped Vere. What a lucky thing that he had taken into his head not to pull to-day! Fresher than Vere, he just managed to land Millbank and himself. The shouts of Vere called us, and we arrived to find the bodies of Millbank and Coningsby apparently lifeless, for Millbank was quite gone, and Coningsby had swooned on landing. "'If Coningsby had been lost,' said Henry Sidney, "'I never would have shown my face at Eton again.' "'Can you conceive of a position more terrible?' said Buckhurst. I declare I shall never forget it as long as I live. However, there was the lockhouse at hand, and we got blankets and brandy. Coningsby was soon all right, but Millbank, I can tell you, gave us some trouble. I thought it was all up, didn't you, Henry Sidney? The most fishy thing I ever saw, said Henry Sidney. Well, we were fairly frightened here, said Sedgwick. The first report was that you had gone, but that seemed without foundation but Coningsby was quite given up. Where are they now? They are both at their tutors. I thought they had better keep quiet. Vere is with Millbank, and we are going back to Coningsby directly, but we thought it best to show, finding on our arrival, that there were all sorts of rumours about. I think it will be best to report at once to my tutor, for he will be sure to hear something. I would, if I were you." End of chapter 9 Book 1, chapter 10 What wonderful things are events! The least are of greater importance than the most sublime and comprehensive speculations. 
In what fanciful schemes to obtain the friendship of Coningsby had Millbank in his reveries often indulged? What combinations that were to extend over years and influence their lives? But the moment that he entered the world of action, his pride recoiled from the plans and hopes which his sympathy had inspired. His sensibility and his inordinate self-respect were always at variance, and he seldom exchanged a word with the being whose ideas engrossed his affection. And now, suddenly an event had occurred, like all events unforeseen, which in a few brief, agitating, tumultuous moments had singularly and utterly changed the relations that previously subsisted between him and the former object of his concealed tenderness. Millbank now stood with respect to Coningsby in the position of one who owes to another the greatest conceivable obligation, a favour which time could permit him neither to forget nor to repay. Pride was a sentiment that could no longer subsist before the preserver of his life. Devotion to that being, open, almost ostentatious, was now a duty, a paramount and absorbing tie. The sense of past peril, the rapture of escape, a renewed relish for the life so nearly forfeited, a deep sentiment of devout gratitude to the providence that had guarded over him, for Millbank was an eminently religious boy, a thought of home, and the anguish that might have overwhelmed his hearth, all these were powerful and exciting emotions for a young and fervent mind, in addition to the peculiar source of sensibility on which we have already touched. Lord Vere, who lodged in the same house as Millbank, and was sitting by his bedside, observed as night fell that his mind wandered. The illness of Millbank, the character of which soon transpired and was soon exaggerated, attracted the public attention with increased interest to the circumstances out of which it had arisen, and from which the parties principally concerned had wished to have diverted notice. The sufferer, indeed, had transgressed the rules of the school by bathing at an unlicensed spot, where there were no expert swimmers in attendance, as is customary, to instruct the practice and to guard over the lives of the young adventurers. But the circumstances with which this violation of rule had been accompanied, and the assurance of several of the party that they had not themselves infringed the regulations, combined with the high character of Millbank, made the authorities not over-anxious to visit with penalties a breach of observance which, in the case of the only proved offender, had been attended with such impressive consequences. The feat of Coningsby was extolled by all as an act of high gallantry and skill. It confirmed and increased the great reputation which he already enjoyed. "'Millbank is getting quite well,' said Buckhurst to Coningsby, a few days after the accident. "'Henry Sidney and I are going to see him. Will you come?' "'I think we shall be too many. I will go another day,' replied Coningsby. So they went without him. They found Millbank up and reading. "'Well, old fellow,' said Buckhurst, "'how are you? We should have come up before, but they would not let us. And you are quite right now, eh?' "'Quite. Has there been any row about it?' "'All blown over,' said Henry Sidney. "'Coningsby behaved like a trump.' "'I have seen nobody yet,' said Millbank. "'They would not let me till to-day.' Vere looked in this morning, and left me this book, but I was asleep. I hope they will let me out in a day or two. I want to thank Coningsby. I shall never rest till I have thanked Coningsby. Oh, he will come to see you, said Henry Sidney. I asked him just now to come with us. Yes, said Millbank eagerly, and what did he say? He thought we should be too many. I hope I shall see him soon, said Millbank, somehow or other. I will tell him to come, said Buckhurst. Oh, no, 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 don't tell him to come, said Millbank. Don't bore him. I know he is going to play a match at fives this afternoon, said Buckhurst, for I am one. And who are the others, inquired Millbank? Herbert and Campbell. Herbert is no match for Coningsby, said Millbank. And then they talked over all that had happened since his absence, and Buckhurst gave him a graphic report of the excitement on the afternoon of the accident, at last they were obliged to leave him. "'Well, good-bye, old fellow. We will come and see you every day. What can we do for you? Any books or anything?' "'If any fellow asks after me,' said Millbank, "'tell him I shall be glad to see him. It is very dull being alone. 
but do not tell any fellow to come if he does not ask after me. Notwithstanding the kind suggestions of Buckhurst and Henry Sidney, Coningsby could not easily bring himself to call on Millbank. He felt a constraint. It seemed as if he went to receive thanks. He would rather have met Millbank again in school or in the playing fields. Without being able then to analyze his feelings, he shrank unconsciously from that ebullition of sentiment which in more artificial circles is described as a scene. Not that any dislike of Millbank prompted him to this reserve. On the contrary, since he had conferred a great obligation on Millbank, his prejudice against him had sensibly decreased. How it would have been had Millbank saved Coningsby's life is quite another affair. Probably, as Coningsby was by nature generous, his sense of justice might have struggled successfully with his painful sense of the overwhelming obligation. But in the present case there was no element to disturb his fair self-satisfaction. He had greatly distinguished himself, he had conferred on his rival an essential service, and the whole world rang with his applause. He began rather to like Millbank. We won't say because Millbank was the unintentional cause of his pleasurable sensations. Really, it was that the unusual circumstances had prompted him to a more impartial judgment of his rival's character. In this mood, the day after the visit of Buckhurst and Henry Sidney, Coningsby called on Millbank, but finding his medical attendant with him, Coningsby availed himself of that excuse for going away without seeing him. The next day he left Millbank a newspaper on his way to school, time not permitting a visit. Two days after, going into his room, he found on his table a letter addressed to Harry Coningsby, Esquire. Eton, May, blank, 1832. Dear Coningsby, I very much fear that you must think me a very ungrateful fellow, because you have not heard from me before, but I was in hopes that I might get out and say to you what I feel but whether I speak or write, it is quite impossible for me to make you understand the feelings of my heart to you. Now, I will say at once that I have always liked you better than any fellow in the school, and always thought you the cleverest. Indeed, I always thought that there was no one like you, but I never would say this or show this, because you never seemed to care for me, and because I was afraid you would think I merely wanted to con with you, as they used to say of some other fellows, whose names I will not mention, because they always tried to do so with Henry Sidney and you. I do not want this at all, but I want, though we may not speak to each other more than before, that we may be friends, and that you will always know that there is nothing I will not do for you, and that I like you better than any fellow at Eton. And I do not mean that this shall be only at Eton, but afterwards, whatever we may be, that you will always remember that there is nothing I will not do for you, not because you saved my life, though that is a great thing, but because before that I would have done anything for you, only for the cause above mentioned, I would not show it. I do not expect that we shall be more together than before, nor can I ever suppose that you would like me as you like Henry Sidney and Buckhurst, or even as you like Veer. But still I hope you will always think of me with kindness now, and let me sign myself, if I ever do write to you, your most attached, affectionate, and devoted friend, Oswald Milbank. End of chapter 10